Christ died, we died with him. Though he slays me, yet will I trust in him. Good morning. I'd like to welcome you this morning to Berean Bible Church. I think you probably know we're studying the feasts of Yahweh. These are not Israel's feasts. They are the feasts of Yahweh. There's seven of them. And the number seven is recognized as a very special number from the Jewish point of view. It's a number that speaks of spiritual completeness and fullness. In these feasts, we say Yahweh's complete plan of redemption. Now let me ask you something. Can you name the seven feasts in their correct order? Where do we start? Next. All right. Now these two really are connected, okay? And I think the problem in Scripture, we try to separate them and we, you know, they are a day apart. Leviticus tells us that. But they are very connected because the sacrifice given on Passover opened up the exodus that took place beginning the next day. What's the next feast we're going to look at today? First fruits. And then comes Pentecost. That's what we call it. They didn't really call it that. We'll talk about that next week. All right, those are the spring feasts. Now, the fall feasts are what? Trumpets. Day of Atonement. Tabernacles. We'll get into those in the coming weeks. But these seven feasts represent and typify the sequence, the timing, and the significance of the major events of the Lord's redemptive career. You want to study redemption, you've got to study the feasts. And these feasts are a study in typology. Biblical typology takes the unity of both covenants and sees in the Old Covenant types, shadows, pictures, which prefigure something in the New Covenant. Now, these types can be people, they can be places, objects, and events. Typological language in the Old Covenant is called a type, and the counterpart, the, the fulfillment, the reality, is called what? The anti-type. That sounds a little strange to us. Anti, you know, almost gives us the idea it's not, you know, it's against, but that's not the idea. It's the fulfillment. A type always prefigures something future. A scriptural type and predictive prophecy are in substance the same, differing only in form. So these feasts are prophetic. They are prophesying of something yet to come. They are prophesying to Israel about what is going to happen in their future as God redeems them. And as they rehearse these year after year at the appointed times, they're seeing a picture of Yahweh and His completed redemption. The, these are literally rehearsals. Now, I think if we talk about rehearsals, I think you, under, you understand a wedding rehearsal. All right, wedding rehearsal is just so you get things right so on the day of the wedding you, you know what you're supposed to do and everyone's doing the right thing. All right, you can't just quit at the rehearsal. You've got to have the real wedding. The rehearsal doesn't marry anybody. And these were rehearsals, rehearsing what was to come. The whole Tanakh, which is, we call the Old Testament, the Hebrews don't call it that, <laughs> you can understand that, right? The Tanakh, it pointed to the coming of Yeshua the Messiah. Now people think, well, you've got to get to the New Testament, the New Covenant, to see about Yeshua. No, the whole Old Testament pointed to him. Look at Acts 17. This is the complete Jewish Bible. According to his usual practice, Shaul went in and on three Sabbats, he gave them drashes from the Tanakh, explaining and proving that Messiah had to suffer and rise again from the dead, and that this Yeshua, whom I am proclaiming to you, is the Messiah. So here, Shaul, he takes the Tanakh, the Hebrew Scriptures, and he gives a drash that's, that's basically a sermon, an exposition. He is taking those Old Covenant Scriptures and teaching about Messiah. In Acts 18, it says, And he powerfully and conclusively refuted the unbelieving Jews in public, demonstrating by the Tanakh that Yeshua is the Messiah. Again, he's taking the Tanakh. Now, we could narrow it even further because Yeshua taught the same thing, but he said the Torah, the first five books of Moses, were just all about him. 
In John 5, 46, he says, For if you believe Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote about me. Boy, that's stunning. That, that shows us how much we don't understand our Bibles, because Yeshua says the, first, the Torah, the first five books, that's Moses. They're all about me. The two downcast disciples on the road to Emmaus, remember Yeshua comes back and he talks to them, and he says, beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them all the scriptures, the things concerning himself. He's just showing them this is all. And I'm sure when he talked to those two disciples on the road to Emmaus, he says, remember these feasts that you've been going through year after year after year? They pointed to Yeshua. So the Torah, the first five books, and in the whole Tanakh, the complete Hebrew scriptures, Yeshua can be clearly seen. We see these feasts in the Torah. They all picture and point to Christ. And we've been talking for a couple of weeks now about the ancient pictorial language, and we'll be talking about it a lot more because I'm studying it, and it is fantastic, and I'm going to share some of it with you. But let's look at the word Torah. This is the ancient pictorial language. Now, the last one there, <coughs> well, let me back up here. Yeah, <laughs> the last is the first, okay? From, what, from our perspective. Each letter has a meaning. All right, the modern Hebrew looks like this. The first letter is the Tav, with that cross. That's the Tav. That's the first letter. Okay, we're reading right to left in Hebrew. The second letter is the Vav. It's a nail. Now, you see it had, that hasn't really changed much. The third letter is the Rash, and that looks like a person's head. The last letter is the He. And it looks like a window as if to say, behold. Now, when I showed you, I don't know, it was last week, the week before Yeshua, and you had the little man standing there with his arms up, that that's, goes further even back than this hay that is there. This is more of a, <clears throat> a paleo version of the hay, but the idea is behold. So, taking the meaning of each letter, and that's the thing, okay, this word means Torah. Now, if you were asked, what is Torah? You'd probably say, well, that's law, right? To the Hebrews, Torah means a journey. The Torah is a journey. But if you took each individual letter here, the pictorial letters that each have meaning in the self, you'd get this meaning, revealing the highest person that is nailed to the cross. That's what Torah means. That's incredible. Ancient Hebrews are writing this thousands of years before Christ. All right, well, so far in our studies, <clears throat> we've looked at two of the feasts. Let's review them briefly before we go on this morning. We started with Passover. It occurs in the spring of the year. It occurs on the 14th day of the Hebrew month, Nisan, which was March or April. Passover is a type. It's a picture of something much greater. It pictured the redemption of God's elect through the sacrifice of the sinless Son of God, the Lord Yeshua. In the evening on the 14th of Nisan, at exactly 3 p.m., the Passover lamb was killed. And 1,600 years after Passover was instituted, Yeshua, the Lamb of God, was killed on the very same day at the very same time as the Passover lambs at 3 p.m. Like the lamb, Yeshua was without spot or blemish, Peter tells us. Like the lamb, not a bone in his body was broken, John 19, 33 and following tells us. The lamb was the type. Yeshua is the anti-type. Then we saw unleavened bread. This takes place on the very next day, the 15th of Nisan, and it lasts for seven days. Remember that seven being the number of completion, totality. And most people try to make unleavened bread a picture of the burial of Yeshua. That way you have the Passover picturing his death, Unleavened bread picturing his burial and first fruits picturing his resurrection. It's cool, you got the whole gospel in there, right? Now, I pulled this quote from this guy that I don't have much confidence in, but look what he says. <laughs> he says, The feast of unleavened bread pictures the burial of Yeshua. This, was a, this feast was to take place the day after Passover. Yeshua was buried the next day. Okay, th this is wrong. This guy, I, I don't pay much attention to the stuff you read from him, okay? Well, why did I teach that? 
as I was studying this time, I'm like, I see it so clearly. I'm like, how did I ever get that? And the only thing, the only explanation I can come up with is I was just following the calf path. You know the calf path. We've talked about that. Let me give you just an excerpt from it. It says, for men are prone to go it blind along the calf paths of the mind and work away from sun to sun to do what other men have done. They follow in the beaten track and out and in and forth and back and still their devious course pursue to keep the paths that others do. That's from the Calf Path by S.W. Foss. The whole thing is really good, but it just talks about, you know, that original calf took, calf took a path, and everybody just seems to follow the path. It, it, it is so easy to follow the Calf Path, okay? It just is, you know, because, you know, you read other people, and you have respect for them, and you just say, well, they know what they're talking about, and especially if it sounds good to you, and this sounds good, death, burial, and resurrection, so, I, you know, so again, I want to apologize for following that path. But as I said, so many people do it. You know, and instead of going back to the original source, the scriptures, too often we read what others say, and then we just keep following the path. And guess what? If one of those guys is off, guess what? We just keep going off the path. And we have to stop and forget about what everybody says and come back to the original scriptures and see what is really there. And listen, this is why I keep telling you don't believe what I say. Be a Berean and study it yourself. Because that's so important. You know, you have to go and check behind what you hear. Be a Berean. Don't accept it, but also don't reject it. Take it and do some research and say, yeah, that makes sense. That lines up. And to tell you the truth, this week as I was studying this, I was kind of surprised that no one ever called me out on this. I get called out on all kinds of stuff, people. Believe me, okay? <laughs> people write me, you know, email, I can't believe you, the last one was, I can't believe you said there's a communist in the White House. Well, I did, you know, and I believe that, so I didn't say who it was, I just said there was one there, you know, okay? <laughs> but people call me out, so I'm just surprised I never got called out on this. But let me ask you this, what is wrong with this quote? Look at it. What's wrong with it? From what you, What? Yeshua was buried the next day. Why wasn't he? Because that day was a Sabbath, okay? Unleavened bread can't picture his burial because he wasn't buried on that day. That's the 15th. It's a Sabbath. It's a holy day. Speaking of the dead body of Yeshua, Luke says this, and he took it down and he wrapped it in a linen cloth and he laid him in a tomb cut into the rock where no one had ever lain. It was the preparation day. What day is that? That's the 14th. That's Passover. That's the preparation day. And the Sabbath was about to begin. So he, he couldn't have been put in on that day. It was Passover. That's the day he was buried. He was buried the same day he was killed. He was put in the tomb before the sun set on the 14th. Unleavened bread starts on the 15th. And it pictures, not burial, I think it pictures deliverance. The children of Israel left Egypt on the first day of unleavened bread, and they crossed the Red Sea on the last day of unleavened bread, meaning here's the perfect deliverance. Not only are they now out of Egypt, the Egyptians are done. Okay? They don't have to worry about them anymore. So there's the, the number seven. There's the per perfect redemption. And this exodus that this feast pictures was a type. And it's so important that we understand this, especially as we get into the fall feasts. It's that the anti-type is seen in the redemption that Yeshua brings from the sin and the death to us today. The exodus, which was a, a type, the anti-type comes in salvation. And this second exodus was spoken of by the prophets. Look what Isaiah said. Then in that day, the nations will resort to the root of Jesse, who will stand as a signal for the people, and his resting place will be glorious. Then it will happen on that day that Yahweh will again recover the second time with his hand the remnant of his people. Now Isaiah 11, 1 through 12, predicts the coming of Messiah's rule and his reuniting the 12 tribes of Israel. That was to be accomplished, he says, by a second exodus. Now, when did the second exodus begin? Well, to answer that, we need to know when the first exodus began. It began, we saw, on the Feast of Unleavened Bread. So the anti-type would begin on the Feast of Unleavened Bread also. 
Notice what Matthew says of Yeshua in Matthew 2.14. He says, And he rose and he took the child and his mother by night and departed for Egypt and was there until the death of Herod, that what was spoken by Yahweh through the prophet might be fulfilled, saying, Out of Egypt did I call my son. Now, the New American Standard Bible, when it has things in all caps like this, it's a quotation from the Tanakh. So Matthew says that Yeshua and his parents fleeing to Egypt to escape Herod and their return after his death is what Hosea was talking about. Now, if Matthew wouldn't have told us that, guess what? You'll never get that from Hosea. And so what we're seeing here is the New Testament, the New Covenant is interpreting for us Old Covenant language. Let's go back to Hosea. When Israel was a youth, I loved him, and out of Egypt I called my son. Now, this is written by Hosea, according to the first verse in the book. How can we know what his intentions are in this passage? Well, we have to know approximately when he lived. We also have to have the broader context of the whole book, which gives us a fuller idea of what Hosea intended to say in this one verse. And when we study his text in the context of the entire book, we find out that Hosea is referring to the exodus described in the book of Egypt. So Hosea is talking about the Israelites coming out of the exodus. Well, then how does Matthew reinterpret this? Well, in Matthew 2.15, the writer takes this text and he applies it to Yeshua, who as a youth was returning, from Ju returning to Judea from Egypt. See, this reference doesn't seem to keep with the intention of Hosea at all. And I think it's here that we need to remember where the meaning of a text ultimately resides in the intention of its author, Yahweh himself. And as we read the scriptures in the context of the Bible as a whole, we see that he has made an analogy here between Israel, God's son being freed from Egypt, and Yeshua, God's son, coming up from Egypt. And this pattern runs through the whole Gospel of Matthew. Out of Egypt I have called my son, is Exodus terminology where Yeshua is the true Israel of God. And I think we've gone over that, so I think you have that concept. Let me try to give you a visual here to help you. These seven feasts picture a 40-year second Exodus period. All right, this, we, we're talking about an Exodus beginning, and that's the whole thing with unleavened bread. The Exodus began. So this is, the, this is what these feasts are all about. They picture this 40-year period, but they're not spread out, you know, throughout the whole 40 years. You've got Passover, unleavened bread, first fruits. These take 55 days. From the start of Passover to the end of Pentecost is 55 days. Then you have a gap between them of 39.8 years. Then you have the final feast, trumpets, day of atonement, and tabernacles that make up 22 days. It's interesting that that's 77 days. We've got those sevens again. The setting for the New Covenant story is the return to the desert or wilderness for Israel. And the 40 years between A.D. 30 when this began in Passover and A.D. 70, there are a second exodus, the antitype of this physical exodus out of Egypt. And you know, is it just a coincidence that when these feasts started again, that this exodus ended in 40 years with the destruction of the temple? Just another 40-year period that is so significant? We're going to get into this as we get into the fall feast. You'll see how important this understanding this 40 years is. But just uh, keep that in mind. We will come back. The crossing of the Red Sea was just a beautiful type of salvation from the bondage of sin. Deliverance from sin's bondage like theirs is not possible by human means. We, we saw that the exodus was supernatural, that God was working in a supernatural way to deliver these children. Well, that's the exact, exact same thing as our salvation. We have to understand that is supernatural. It's not something we earn. It's not something we work for. It's not something we do. It's something God gives to those who trust Him. What did they do when they got through the Red Sea and got to the other side? What did they do? It's the first thing they did. What? No. They sang. Exodus 15 is called the Song of Moses. All right? Now, before we, I want to go to the song and read it, but before we do, you got to picture this. All right? They're, they're in bondage to Egypt, hard bondage. You know, they're, they're grinding out this existence. They've been set free through a set of miracles. 
They've gone through the wilderness. They're going down that wadi. Now they think we're going to die here. And all of a sudden, the sea opens up. They go through on dry ground. They get to the other side. The sea closes it. All the Egyptians, Pharaoh and his army are in there, and they just are crushed. So now they're standing on the other side looking at this. And the sea is flat again. And their enemy is totally gone. And then we, we pick up in Exodus 15. It says, Then Moses and the sons of Israel sang this song to Yahweh and said, I will sing to Yahweh. For he is highly exalted, the horse and the rider he has cast into the sea. Yahweh is my strength and song, and he has become my Yeshua. That's the word for salvation there. This is my God, and I will praise him, my Father's God, and I will extol him. Yahweh is a warrior. Yahweh is his name. It's kind of foolish. The Lord is his name. The Lord's not a name. The Lord's a title. Okay, Yahweh is his name. Pharaoh's chariots and his armies he has cast into the sea and the choices of his officers and drowned in the Red Sea. The deeps cover them. They went down into the deeps like a stone. Your right hand, O Yahweh, is majestic in power. Your right hand, O Yahweh, shatters the enemy. And they're just on this other side just singing praises to Yahweh. The term here, God's right hand, in prophecy often refers to the Messiah, the right hand of God. All right, the third feast is the feast of, what am I doing? Where'd that come from? Oh, I know what I'm doing. I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> the, th the third feast we come to is first fruits. I was expecting a different slide there. Uh, this is Leviticus 23, 9 through 14. And we're going to read this passage just so you get the context. Because this is all in Leviticus. We're working through Leviticus because these were the seven feasts are listed in order. It says, Then Yahweh spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the sons of Israel and say to them, When you enter the land which I am going to give you, and you reap its harvest, then you shall bring in the sheath of the first fruits of your harvest to the priest. He shall wave the sheath before Yahweh for you to be accepted. On the day after the Sabbath, the priest shall wave it. Now on the day when you, were, you wave the sheaf, you shall offer a male lamb, one year old, without defect, for a burnt offering to Yahweh. Let me stop here just for a second to say, most people, well, I, I say all people that I know who teach on the feasts now, all believe these feasts are applicable to us today and we should be doing them today. Well, three of the feasts were called pilgrim feasts which meant you had to go to Jerusalem on that feast day to celebrate that feast. No matter where you lived, you pack up your stuff, you went for the feast. And I don't know anybody that's going to Jerusalem now to celebrate the feast. They're packing up and moving there. And when you get there, this, you have to offer a male lamb, one year old, without defect. Okay? Israel has not done that since AD 70 when the temple was destroyed. So you know, those people are saying we need to keep this. The feasts are shadows. They're pictures. All right? Its grain offering shall be two-tenths of an ephah of fine flour mixed with oil, an offering by fire to Yahweh for a soothing aroma. With its drink offering, a fourth a hint of wine, until this same day, until you have brought in the offering of your God, you shall eat neither bread nor roasted grain nor new growth. See, until they bring in the first fruit offering, they can't eat the fruit. Until they bring that barley harvest in and, and offer it before Yahweh, they are not allowed to eat it. It says, it is to be a perpetual statute throughout your generations and all your dwelling places. All right, that's the text. Now let's back up and look at verse 10. He says, speak to the sons of Israel and say to them, when you enter the land which I am going to give you, and you reap its harvest, then you shall bring in the sheath of the first fruits of your harvest to the priest. When are they to start observing this feast? When you enter the land. When is that? That is after the exodus. After the 40 years, once they get in the land, they cross the Jordan, they're in the promised land, then they're to do it. Hang on to that thought. Just put it in your memory somewhere. We'll come back to it, all right? This is referring to the barley harvest. The first crop planted in winter, it's now spring and it's beginning to ripen. And the first sheath of the harvest is cut in a very carefully prescribed and meticulous ceremony, it's presented to Yahweh. The Lord's acceptance of the first fruits is an earnest or pledge on his part 
of a full harvest. Now the word here, first fruits, is from the Hebrew word reshit. This is the same word you find in Genesis 1.1 in the reshit. In Genesis, though, it's actually Bereshit because it's in beginning. So it's Bereshit. That's the, actually the name of the book. It, the first book of the Bible is Bereshit. You know what the name Genesis? That's the Greek name. Isn't it interesting? We, we take the Hebrew Bible and put Greek names you know, as titles for it. It's Bereshit. It's the beginning. Well, this word Reshit can be used for a beginning of an event, but its very literal meaning is summit. Summit. Or you could say the choicest of the choice or the best. Notice how it's used in Numbers 18.12. All the best of the fresh oil, all the best of the fresh wine and of the grain, the first fruits to those which you give to Yahweh, I give them to you. So first fruits here, is also reshit. It is to be the first, it is to be the very best of the harvest. The people were to bring a sheath of grain to the priest who would wave it before Yahweh. Listen, this is a, an agricultural society. All right, They depend on their harvest to live. So they're bringing the first of it to Yahweh, presenting it to Him as an offering that He would bring in the full harvest. They also would offer up a burnt offering, a meal offering, and a drink offering. Those were required at that same time. Now, if we go to Deuteronomy 26, 1 through 10, it gives us some more detail on this procedure. So we're going to go there. I want you to see the, the complete procedure in Deuteronomy here. Then it shall be when you enter the land, which Yahweh your God gives you as an inheritance. Again, when you enter the land. And you possess it and live in it. Then you shall take some of the first of all the produce of the ground, which you bring in from your land, to Yahweh your God, you, that Yahweh your God gives you, and you shall put it in a basket. <clears throat> okay, back right into the land. Put it in a basket at the place where Yahweh your God chooses to establish his name. And where is that? What's he referring to? The temple. Okay? This is the temple. Now remember, they're, they're, in, the, they're in the wilderness still. They haven't, you know, this, they haven't gotten there yet, but when you get there, after you're in the land, you take it to the place where God's name was established at Jerusalem. You shall go to the priest who was in office at that time and say to him, I declare this day to Yahweh my God that I have entered the land which Yahweh swore to my fathers to give me. What's he saying? He says, Yahweh's kept his promises. And I'm here to offer this sheath as an offering to remember the fact that he kept the promise. I'm in the land. Then the priest shall take the basket from your hand and set it before the altar of Yahweh your God. You shall answer and say before Yahweh your God, My father was a wandering Aramean, and he went down to Egypt and sojourned there, few in number. But there he became a great, mighty, and populous nation. And the Egyptians treated us harshly and afflicted us and imposed hard labor on us. Then we cried out to Yahweh, the God of our fathers. And Yahweh heard our voice and saw our afflictions and our toil and our oppression. And Yahweh brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm, and with great terror, and with signs and wonders. And he has brought us to this place, and has given us this land, a land flowing with milk and honey. Again, God brought them out of their bondage, and he brought them into this beautiful land that they're in now. He says, now behold, I have brought the first of the produce of the ground which you, O Yahweh, have given me. And you shall set it down before Yahweh your God, and worship before Yahweh your God. So as we've already seen in Leviticus, no grain was to be harvested until that offering was brought to the Lord. The offering was made in a remembrance of Israel's sojourn out of Egypt. And Yahweh's delivering them from slavery and their possession of the land flowing with milk and honey is all part of this remembrance. We want to remember this. So first fruits was the first portion of a larger harvest. Now let's go back to our text in Leviticus. And he said, you shall wave the sheep before Yahweh... For you to be accepted on the day after the Sabbath, the priest shall wave it. All right, Passover's on the 14th, unleavened bread's on the 15th. What date is first fruits? It's right there. What date is it? There's, uh, on the day after the Sabbath. Most scholars say the Feast of First Fruits takes place on the 16th of Nisan. 
Okay, well, if it takes place on the 16th, why didn't he just say on the 16th? He says the 14th. He says the 15th. There's no date for first fruits. There's no date for Pentecost. The reason there's no date for Pentecost is why? It's attached to first fruits. It's 50 days after first fruits. So you can't give a date for that because you've got to find out when first fruits is. Those are the only two feasts there's no date for. So if this was 16, why didn't he just say on the 16th? <clears throat> well, they adjusted their calendars based on the harvest, okay? Because they're on a lunar calendar, so they actually did. You know, the harvest would set the calendar. If, if harvest was late, they'd call the, the year would be Aviv, and they would, it would, they would add, actually add another month to their calendar. But, but here, what he's trying to explain, all right, if first fruits is on the 16th, like many people say it is, and it pictures Christ's resurrection... This only allows Christ to be in the grave for a day and a half at best. All right? A day and a half. Well, let's look what Matthew says. Then some of the scribes and the Pharisees said to him, Teacher, we want to see a sign from you. The word sign here, semion, it basically means miracle. Show us a miracle. And he answered and said to them, An evil and adulterous generation craves for a miracle. And yet no miracle will be given to it but the miracle of Jonah the prophet. All right? <clears throat> That's the sign they're going to get, the miracle of Jonah. So basically they're saying, yeah, show us a miracle. So he says, I'm going to show you a miracle. The miracle of Jonah the prophet. Here's the miracle. For just as Jonah was, in, was three days and three nights in the belly of the sea monster, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Now, I take this to mean three full days, and three full nights, or 72 hours. All right? Because that's what it says. Three days and three nights. It's kind of specific. That's 72 hours. I mean, you got 24-hour days, right? We know that Yeshua was buried at the end of the 14th. Just before the sun went down, he's in the tomb on the 15th of Nisan. He would have remained in the tomb until the 18th of Nisan. There's no date given in Scripture for the Feast of first fruits because it is always on the day after the Sabbath. It's always on Sunday. So the date would change from year to year. But it's always on Sunday, the first day of the week. And see, most people take it when he, when he says, you know, on the day after the Sabbath, they don't recognize that he's not talking about the Sabbath of unleavened bread. He's talking about the weekly Sabbath. So this date is, that's why there's no date given, because it's always on Sunday, and sun, the date changes from year to year. Just like our holidays, you know, Christmas can be on this day. It's always on the 25th, but it changes the day it's on. Well, this day is solid, and the date changes. What is interesting is that on the year that Christ was crucified, there had to be three days between the 14th and the first day of the week. Just so happened. There was that year. What another coincidence. You know that? All right, if Christ spent three days and three nights in the grave, this would mean that the traditional idea of Good Friday is incorrect. I hate to ruin anybody's you know, concept of things here, but I believe that Yeshua was crucified on Wednesday. Okay? So now you've got to celebrate Good Wednesday. I don't know if you're allowed to eat fish on Good Wednesday or not, okay? <laughs> or have to eat fish, I mean, on Good Wednesday. Listen, <clears throat> yeah. he was buried by the end of the day on Wednesday. He was in the grave from Thursday at sundown until Saturday at sundown, which is three days and three nights. And he rose from the dead any time after that day ended. Sometime after sundown, Saturday evening. Here's a timeline. Passover is on the 14th of Nisan, Wednesday. Yeshua was tried early in the morning. He was declared faultless by Pilate. He was hung on the cross from 9 a.m. till 3 p.m. He dies the same time the final Passover lamb is being slaughtered in the temple. He's prepared for burial and placed in the tomb just before sunset. Unleavened bread starts on the 15th. That's the first day that he is in the grave. This is a high Sabbath, so he's in the grave before this. He's in the tomb first day and first night. 16th of Nisan, Friday, second day, second night. 17th of Nisan, Saturday, that's the Jewish Sabbath, the weekly Sabbath. That's the third day. Yeshua is resurrected at the close of the Sabbath, the beginning of the first day of the week. This is the, first, this is the day of first fruits. First fruits is always 
after the weekly Sabbath, always on the first day of the week. And it's interesting, on the day of first fruits, they couldn't find the body at the tomb. The tomb was empty. The confusion about Yeshua, I think, being crucified on Friday may come from this text in John. The Jews, therefore, because it was the day of preparation, so that the body should not be remain, remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for that Sabbath was a high day, asked Pilate that the legs might be broken and then they might be taken away. All right, they didn't want his body to remain on the cross on the Sabbath, so they just take it that's the weekly Sabbath, so he must have been killed on Friday. But you've got to remember, the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread is a high Sabbath. No work is to be done. All right. <clears throat> so Passover occurs on the 14th. Unleavened Bread on the 15th. Lasts until the 22nd. First fruits occurs on the day after the weekly Sabbath, the first day of the week. It's always on a Sunday. And that's why there's no date. You know, if it, was, if it happened on the 16th, why wouldn't they say the 16th? Now, what's the significance of the, fe the Feast of First Fruits? All these feasts picture something. What does First Fruits picture? The resurrection. And it just so happens that he was resurrected on that day. Look at 1 Corinthians. But now, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who are asleep. For since by man came death, by a man came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all shall be made alive, but each according to his order. Watch, Christ, the first fruits. After that, those who are Christ at his coming. On one particular morning, on the first day of the week, the feast of first, first fruits are being waved before the altar in the temple, and on that particular morning, some women are heading to a tomb, and they find it empty. And remember now, this is the first fruits of the barley harvest. This is a reference to Yeshua the Christ and his resurrection. The first fruits were transferred to the Lord as an assurance of divine blessing on the harvest. And that's reiterated in Romans here, um, 11, 16, where he says, and the first piece of dough is, if the first piece of dough is holy, the lump is also holy. If the root is holy, the branches are holy too. The first fruit consecrates the whole harvest. So Yeshua is the first of the first fruits. Look at Romans 8, 23. And not only this, but also we ourselves having the first fruits of the Spirit. It's likely that this expression of the Spirit is an appositional genitive, which would render it in English the first fruits which are the Spirit. The Spirit was given as a pledge, which is the Greek word erobon. It means a pledge, a down payment, part of the purchase money. It's a guarantee. So the Spirit was given, it was the first fruits. And God commanded the Israelites to present a portion of their harvest that ripened first as an offering to Him. And that offering acknowledged that the whole harvest from him was really his. It was an offering that the Israelites made in faith, confident that the rest of the harvest would follow. And similarly, God's gift of the Spirit to the first century believers is his pledge that he's going to complete that process of salvation. So 1,600 years before Christ's resurrection, Yahweh predicted in type and shadow that Yeshua would be crucified on the 14th of Nisan. He would rise from the dead three days later on the first day of the week, and it happened just exactly as God had prophesied. Now listen to me. Prophecy proves the truthfulness of this book. See, I brought my Bible in, so I, didn't have to, I would figure I'd look dumb if I waved my phone. <laughs> That's what I read on, okay? But, you know, this is more associated with the Bible. So prophecy proves the truthfulness of this. And listen, if you want to, you know, and I know people question, well, I don't think it's, you know, men wrote it. Listen, just study the prophecy of the Bible. That's all you have to do. God said certain things would happen, and they happened exactly when, exactly how he said they would happen. No other book in the world contains the kind of specific prophecies found throughout the pages of the Bible. And to me, it's one of the greatest proofs that it comes to us from God. Hundreds of years, thousands of years before things happened, God said this wouldn't happen, and it happened. How did he know? How did God know that? He is in control. He is God. He is Yahweh. He, br he brings things to pass. Well, here's what's interesting, people. Yeshua not only defeated death for himself, he promises resurrection life to all who put their trust in him. Look what he said in John 11. 
He said, Yeshua said to her, he's, he's at Mary and Martha's brother, Lazarus, had died. Yeshua goes, and Yeshua says to her, Mary said, if you'd have been here, you know, my brother wouldn't have died. And he said, that's okay, I'm here now. And he says, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me shall live even if he dies. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? And she said to him, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God. In verse 26, Yeshua asked, do you believe this? What is this? It's a statement that he makes about himself. He gives in verse 25. He tells Mary he is the resurrection. He is life. But that's not all. He asked her to believe. Yeshua is saying, I guarantee eternal life to everyone who believes in me. He's the guarantee. You trust in me, you will have eternal life. It's not about working for him. It's not about doing things for him. It's about trusting who he is. And because of the resurrection of Christ, these words carry weight they never would have carried otherwise. Listen, if he remained in the grave, people would say, ah, he's just another one, you know, one of these prophets that's whacked out off base. But the resurrection answers the question and ends the argument once for all. Yeshua has the power over death. So I guess that means everything he claimed to be is true. And it is. And the resurrection of Yeshua was a historical fact. It was witnessed by over 500 people. And listen, at that time, you know, when they're talking about the resurrection, they're saying, Christ, four, 500 people witnessed them. You know, they couldn't shut this thing up. And here's the interesting thing. Many of whom witnessed this resurrection later were martyred, put to death in some horrific way because of their faith in him. Now, why in the world would you suffer and die for something you knew wasn't true? It just doesn't make any sense. Well, just as the wave sheaf represented the bulk of the harvest to come, so the resurrection of Yeshua represented the resurrection which was to come. First fruits always symbolizes and prefaced a great harvest that was to come. Christ, the first fruits, is predictive of the great resurrection that they waited for and longed for. So in the study of the feast, we see that every single piece of the Christian Bible falls right into the framework of the Hebrew world. And this is why it's so important that we learn about that world. The whole Christian message is in the feasts that Yahweh gave to the Hebrews. Hundreds of years before it happened, he predicts it all exactly as it would come to pass. Passover is being offered on that first day of the week, and the tomb is empty. Now, according to the Bible, when was the resurrection of believers to take place? Yeshua was the first fruit guarantee of the harvest. He was the first fruit guarantee of the resurrection for all believers. But when was that to take place? Well, remember what we saw? When you enter the land. So, they were to start observing the feast when they got into the land at the end of the Exodus period. And just as the Feast of first fruits began, once they entered the land, I think so the antitype of the resurrection of the dead takes place when the second exodus ended. <clears throat> now, I think the scriptures testify that the time of the resurrection was to be at the time of the old, end of the Old Covenant age, which ended at the end of that 40-year period. When Jerusalem was destroyed, that was the end of Old Covenant Israel. The disciples knew that the fall of the temple, the destruction of the city, meant the end of the Old Covenant age. And the new age. Look what uh, Daniel has to say in Daniel chapter 12. Now at that time Michael, the great prince, who stands guard over the sons of your people, will arise. And there will be a time of distress such as never occurred since there was a nation until that time. Time of really great distress. Right? And he says, at that time, your people, Daniel's people, Israel, everyone who is found written in the book will be rescued. There's a time of trouble, a time of rescue, and many of those who sleep in the dust of the ground will awake, these to everlasting life, but others to disgrace and everlasting contempt. Daniel says that this resurrection is going to come at a time when Israel is going through great trouble. And this sounds just like what Yeshua said in Matthew 24, For then there will be great tribulation such as not occurred since the beginning of the world until now, nor ever will be. And here Yeshua is talking about the destruction of Jerusalem, what hap which happened at the end of the second exodus in AD 70. So first fruits pictures resurrection of the Messiah. 
The feast took place after the first weekly Sabbath or Sunday after the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Yeshua rose from the dead on the first day of the week after the first day of unleavened bread. And the, these are not a coincidence, people. God is teaching the history of redemption. Do you remember what happened after the resurrection at the tomb? Yeshua said to her, Mary, she turned and said to him in Hebrews, Rabboni, which means teacher. Yeshua said to her, Stop clinging to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brethren and say to them, I ascend to the Father and your Father, my God and your God. <clears throat> Stop clinging to me. Now, I remember hearing in my earlier Christian life that this is a separate Greek word here and it means to attach yourself to or whatever. Well, I looked it up and it's really not a separate Greek word at all. It's the normal Greek word used for touching. All right, it's hapto. It's a normal Greek word for touch. So why wouldn't she allowed to touch the risen Messiah? Well, let me give you a little tradition that might answer that. Now, this is not Bible. This is tradition, but you can take it or leave it. All right. Jewish tradition says, as the lambs were being taken off the Temple Mount and put into the ovens by the people, the high priest and his entourage, they would take their lambs into their chamber, into the Temple Mount, Mount Moriah. And they put them in the ovens. Then just before sunset, the high priest would lead his entourage over the Kidron Valley Bridge on the side of the Mount of Olives where the priests had previously planted barley for the first fruit offering. The Levites would then bind the standing stalks, ten of them, together. They're still in the ground. They're not going to cut these stalks. They just put them together and they bind them with a cord. Then the high priest and the Levites go back to their chambers. They eat the Passover lamb. The high priest would stay in the mountain, in the temple, in seclusion until the end of the weekly Sabbath, which was three days, the year the Lord was killed. So the high priest is in seclusion while Yeshua is in seclusion. At the end of the weekly Sabbath, the high priest and his entourage would leave his chamber with baskets and sickles once they were sure the sun had set in front of thousands of onlooking Israelites they would cut the standing stalks of barley that had previously been bound in the light, but now it's dark. The high priest and the Levites would then take the barley in their baskets to the temple. They'd grind the barley, make loaves. Then the high priest would take them and offer them as first fruits offering to Yahweh on the morning of the first day of the week. And until this was done, no one was allowed to eat of the barley harvest. Now, it is said that the high priest had to remain in seclusion on the temple mount for the entire time between the sacrifice of Passover and the presentation of first fruits, so he would not be defiled. There, was, uh, there were baths there that the high priest would cleanse himself in. So now the high priest, he doesn't want to be defiled, so he's not going back out until he offers first fruits offering. Well, Yeshua was also in inclusion, seclusion during this time. And when he says to Mary, don't touch me, for I have not ascended to the Father, but later he tells Thomas, stick your fingers in the nail prints and feel my nail prints and feel your, your hand in my side. Well, how come Mary can't touch him and Thomas can? Well, the answer may be found in the first fruit offering. As a high priest, he had not yet ascended to his father to offer this sacrifice before the father. And later he returned that afternoon to talk with the disciples on the road to Emmaus. Well, that's tradition, okay, but the fact that Yeshua is the antitypical high priest it's very clear in Scripture. Hebrews says, Therefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider Yeshua, the apostle and high priest of our confession. Hebrews 5.10 says, Being designated by God as a high priest according to the order of Melchizedek. Why couldn't he be of the order of Aaron? He wasn't from that tribe. Okay. Yeshua did, just as the high priest had done for centuries, because he is the anti-type, the true high priest. Let's look at another text that may have some light shed on it, maybe, maybe not, from this whole idea of first fruits. This is uh, from Matthew. And Yeshua cried out with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. And behold, the veil of the temple was torn from two from top to bottom. And the earth shook, the rocks were split, the tombs were open, and many bodies of the saints had fallen asleep or raised. All right, this is on Passover. 
All right, after Yeshua dies, it says the tombs are open and bodies of saints had fallen asleep. It goes on to say, and coming out of the tombs after his resurrection, they entered the holy city and appeared to many. When were the tombs open? They were opened at the death of Christ on Passover. When did the bodies come out? First fruits. The earthquakes, the grave opens on Passover, but no one comes out of them yet. And here's what could possibly be. This is, again, this is a possibility, this is a suggestion. This could be the binding of those sheaves on Passover, marking out the graves, marking out these will be resurrected on that day. Just like the high priest went over and marked the sheaves, this could be Yeshua marking the graves. Then on Passover, he goes and raises those graves. Remember what Yeshua said to the Pharisees? He said, I tell you, if these become silent, because they told him, tell your disciples to shut up, tell them to be quiet. He said, if they be quiet, the very stones will cry out. Could Yeshua be referring to gravestones here? Over all the side of the mountain were cemeteries. And now these empty graves are crying out that Yeshua has fulfilled the resurrection. Maybe it's possible. I'm not going to argue about this or fight over this. This is tradition. I'm just suggesting it. I mean, you know, it could make sense. It could answer some questions. If you don't agree with it, that's fine. Don't get hung up on it, okay? Hundreds of years before Christ was ever born, God was teaching his people every year over and over and over in picture form in Passover on the 14th. Yeshua, the Lamb of God, would come and redeem them. And he came on that very same day. And then on the day of first fruits, as they're offering up the, the first fruit harvest, Yeshua was the first to rise from the dead. These are not coincidences. Yeshua is teaching us the history of redemption. And you know, how sad is it that the people who rehearse these feasts every year, year after year, are standing there when it's taking place and they're missing it. They're missing it because they're blind. You may remember that Joseph of Arimathea, he requested the body of Yeshua from Pilate. Now, Joseph had to be extremely wealthy and very influential to be able to approach Pilate personally. And we also understand from Roman law that he had to be next of kin to receive the body. Well, in an extra-biblical conversa conversation, okay, this is not Bible, extra-biblical conversation, we learn that Pilate was surprised at Joseph's request. And Pilate says to Joseph, I don't understand, Joseph. You're a powerful, influential man. You have just completed this new tomb for your family, and now you're going to use this tomb to bury a criminal? And Joseph, looked, jo Joseph of Arimathea looked at him and responded, why not? It's only for the weekend. <laughs> Let's pray. <laughs> Father, we thank you this morning that it was only for the weekend. That you defeated death, you defeated the grave, you rose victorious. And because you live, we too will live. Lord, we thank you. Lord, I thank you for the truths that these feasts teach us as we see so accurately carried out to every detail what you had prophesied hundreds of years prior. Thank you, Lord. Teach us from these feasts. Help us, Lord, to, to just be strengthened, Lord, in our confidence of your word and every detail of it. Lord, I thank you for resurrection life that is promised to all those who will put their trust in you. In the name of Yeshua, we pray. Amen.